Hi there, guys. So I'm joined today with James McDonald again. Um, for those of you that don't know, he is a qualified PT. He's got extensive knowledge in nutrition. It's really quite astounding. Um, I say about most of the people that are in my my chats, but he really knows a lot, and I'm really impressed with his knowledge. Um, I thought bring him on again today, but basically to discuss training, you know, all the things around that. So the actual exercise um, segment of everything to do with being healthier. So it, it might be strength specific or sports specific. So that brings me to my first question. So I want to know, James, is how does specificity apply to different goals and different sports, things like that? I think, uh, well, first of all, I just want to say before I get into it, thanks for having me back on. Um, sure. you know, it's back to be back on the channel and, you know, I, I do really appreciate these conversations. Um, mm specificity is probably the first place you need to look i think when you're programming any sort of exercise you know program for a client or for yourself um and basically where it comes down to is training in a way that's going to be specific to your goals and your adaptations and, and the, you know the adaptations that you're seeking you know to, to that end whether it's strength whether it's uh, hypertrophy so muscle gain whether it's fat loss whether it's increased endurance so uh if, if you're going to do long distance running for example um all of those require a different type of exercise a different way to train um some of them can be similar and sometimes the adaptations will overlap so for example you find this a lot in a gym people who are lifting weights they'll get stronger and bigger at the same time but depending on what their goal is they will train uh in different rep ranges using different amounts of intensity so either heavier or lighter weights um and kind of cycle through different phases depending on their goals at that time mm -hmm. uh, and and really another thing it comes down to is where you are at in your training career if you're quite new you're going to need significantly less volume of training less amount um and even less you know advanced techniques than someone who's been training for five six you know even up to ten or more years consistently brilliant yeah so that would lead me to my next question, and that is, say, we'll go through maybe two or three examples for the viewers, just so they've got an idea of how that would apply to them, because it's very easy for us to just say on a camera, make your training specific to what you want to do. What does that yeah. mean? You know, it's you've got to really define that. So my first question would be, what would your training outline, whether you go into, into uh, explicit description or not, would it be for someone that is an endurance athlete? So whether they be a long distance swimmer, cyclist, anything like that? Yeah, oftentimes it will be training exactly for what they're trying to achieve. Um, and what, what I mean by that is, let's say someone's trying to run a 10K or swim you know, a 5K, what they're gonna be trying to do for the majority of their training is that exact goal you're going to be aiming at swimming for 5k and you know maybe you won't make it that far but you'll get to 2k and then eventually you'll, you'll keep on going and every time you train you will improve upon that and stack it up until that goal same thing with running um for someone who is an endurance athlete uh, an important component despite all the specificity they have to do in going for that specific goal um is, is cross-training at least to some extent to prevent injury. If you find that you're doing very long distances, pounding the pavement especially, it, it has a lot of wear and tear on your joints. Um, and sometimes you, you will atrophy in, in certain ways or you might have uh, more of a, I suppose, a breakdown of, of connective tissue. So for example, your tendons and ligaments, and that's where you find new runners especially, um, and, and other types of endurance athletes, Tend to get tendinopathies, um, a, a lot of joint pain uh, after a short amount of time if they're new or, you know, if they're intermediate, it will take longer, but sometimes that can take longer to recover as well. Um, so cross training will be strengthening the joints as well. For runners, typically one or two full body workouts a week, just full strength exercises. So things like push ups, squats, lunges. Um, especially the unilateral uh, movements for most endurance athletes, that's going to be really important. Um, but for the most part, specificity literally does just does just come down to training to do exactly what you're planning to do. 
some good points. Yeah, you made around. So it might be that you're a long distance athlete. Granted, you'll do a large perform uh, proportion of your training in that f- field. But maybe yeah. that you might benefit a little bit from increasing your strength. So that's there's some nuance there. Um, you you mentioned a good point as well about the tendinopathy and um, new runners. So that almost brings to my next question. So if someone was to ramp up their training or say you had a lay person from Bob, you know, he's just an average bloke. He just left uni or school. How is he going to go to turn into, you know, a long distance athlete? What would his journey be? And, you know, give a rough idea of how long it might take. So they've, they've started as someone who's just left school. They're not an athlete already. They want to do long distance running. So would they yeah. increase their training intensity, their volume? Um, would they use, you know, different methods? Would they run up hills? What would they do? Yeah, that's, 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 that's a, a very broad question. Um, and I think you done that on purpose to see, because we can go into a lot of different areas from there. So we've got this guy called Bob. Um, he wants to be a runner and he's just, you know, left college, no experience or, you know, he's left school or whatever. The first thing you have to look at is what his, what is his current capability? So maybe he'll go out and go for a test run. Um, but for example, if you've got someone who's, who's overweight, has a lot of weight to gain, they don't, they don't want to be hitting the pavement because that weight is going to be compounding down on their joints and they're going to get injured very quickly. So for that person, the first goal might be, okay, let's build up some endurance capacity in, in a low impact way um, and lose some weight first of all. So that would be a combined program of strength training to you know, maintain any muscle as they lose weight. Um, and perhaps do something like a, a, a cross trainer um, or a rowing machine or even swimming or something, something that's light on the joints. Um, in terms of intensity specifically, let's presume this guy's fairly fit and healthy. He just wants to get into running. Um, you'd start off just going at, the, at a steady pace for the most part, working up to the capacity that you can. You don't want to overexert yourself, especially because if you're new, it's easy to get away with doing a lot initially, um, but it, it can end up quite quickly. So, for example, I come back from a running injury in the past. I took, I took quite a few months off and I started running. Where I'd done it was actually interval training. So I started off doing one minute runs and then 30 second breaks, one minute run, 30 second break and done that. Uh, typically about two to four runs a week and just work it up over time into what I was doing consistently three minute intervals and then a two minute break for example and then work that up to five minute ten minute and you'll find that interval training can be a useful way to build up um, an endurance base and when it comes to then piecing it all together so you have a longer period like longer stretch that just comes down to going and doing it so that's where very you know very much specific specificity comes into it so you need to sort of prime yourself is what I'm saying. Yeah, that's a good point. So you'll see outlined that you have to prime yourself. You have to sort of build up to it. I think yeah. that you, you, you'll probably agree, but um, I'd say that's just the fact that as humans, we're only so capable of adapting to the stimulus we're putting in it. There's a limit. So for example, I'm a, I don't know, 18 stone guy or something probably. Um, me running long distance isn't going to work. So what it might be that I have to change my diet and training specifically to do that. So I'm going to have to lose some, some weight, become a lot fitter. I'm not very fit at the moment. Um, that's the, probably the biggest thing. Um, obviously losing weight will eliminate a lot of the stress on my joints. Also you mentioned earlier, you know, you, you include a bit of weight training just to support that. So it can also be preventative in terms of injuries. Um, what yeah. do you think about that? Yeah, no, I mean, that's exactly why I mentioned it in the first place. So that's, you know, I, I, I myself, I, I know people and I have uh, experienced, ex- you know, tendinopathies, um, joint injuries, even what people call niggles like golfer's elbow, tennis elbow. And you'll find that sometimes it can just be overexertion when it comes to running. Um, you know, I, I use the example a lot, but let, let's take even cycling. Um, you might find tele tendinopathy where someone's constantly flexing and using their knee, their knee joint, right? Um, strength training, 
especially at high loads and slow, slow um, tempo has a very beneficial effect on, on your joint tissues. Mm. Uh, the way that works is that, for example, if you're applying, uh, let's say you're, I don't know, 150 pounds and you've got a, another 20 kilo dumbbell with you and you're doing single leg calf raises for your, for your um, Achilles tendon, right? You might do that very slowly, go for, say, anywhere from five to 10 reps or slightly higher and then burn up over time. But when you go slowly, the tendon, your muscle tendon unit, the tendon itself will stretch and expand as you apply tension over time. If you just rep through it very quickly, what's going to happen is that you're just going to be getting the stretch reflex from the tendon, which is what it's supposed to do. It's supposed to absorb load and then, uh, you know, respring it back out into the muscle for, for lack of a better term. And when you slow it down, you're placing that stress specifically on the tendon so that it will strengthen and you're stretching it out in a way that the collagen fibers are going to be neatly aligned in, in a way that you want them to be. Um, and they're not going to be recoiling and bouncing about as much. So that's where strength, uh, you know, what, what, what we call strength training in terms of at least anywhere from 30 to, well, a minimum of 30% of your warm-up max, basically. Um, that's, that's what we go for. And if you stick to that, it, it's, it's very good for your joints in terms of preventing that injury. Yeah, I'd agree. Um, I mean, I, when I first tra started training, I used to have, I, I heard of hammer curls. So what I did was I went to my, my dad's garage. I picked up the biggest hammer I could find. <laughs> Another hammer here. And one was probably about seven kilos. Everyone's was probably about six. They were different size hammers. What I did is I noticed my left bicep was smaller than my right bicep. So I just right. put the bigger weight in my left bicep to try and force adaptation. Problem is, even now, um, what, 13, 14 years later or something, it's still the same difference. Um, even if I start a set, my left side, and finish on my left side, it's still smaller. It seems to be um, rate limiting factors here, like your genetics, your, your the makeup of your muscles, how they're shaped. So what do you out, if someone say to you, look, I'm hitting a plateau, um, you know, like I have sort of thing, my, my left bicep's not as big as my right sort of thing. What would you say to that person? Would it be a case of persevering or would it be a case of reflecting upon that and saying, okay, I've, I've got an imbalance here. I, I might not be able to improve it that much, but I can still work on it. What would you say? Um, most likely the latter. So you make a good point about working on things like imbalances, but there is actually, I, I, I think anyway, something to be said for working through it. Sometimes a bit of persistence. Some people might find that they have, have a plateau um for example in strength training we'll stick to this example you know they're not getting stronger um they've been lifting for in in a mesocycle let's say a few months and at the moment now they're they're, they're not getting any more weight on the bar or on the dumbbell whatever it may be or they're not picking up any bigger hammers <laughs> um sometimes it's not necessarily that you're doing something wrong but you just need to take a step back um but still then come back at it again doing the same modality and you'll find that it was just your body um basically fatigue accumulation and you need, and you need a break um mm. and that's where things like deloads come in quite often so you know deloads are what any athlete would talk about you know whether it's a strength trainer or um, an endurance athlete and that's where you will up your intensity over time you up your, your volume um and then when you find that your adaptations are slowing down you take a step back, you train at maybe half intensity for a week or two, maybe. Um, or some people just take the week off, to be honest, you're not, you're not going to lose muscle or strength in a week. So that's totally mm -hmm. fine. That's what you're more inclined to do. And then when you come back at you're stronger um, and that's your body take, you know, it's kind of that fatigue has then dropped down um, and, and you're fresh again. Uh, in terms of imbalances, one of the most important things can just be unilateral training. Uh, Sometimes people develop imbalances in, say, for example, their biceps. If they're always doing um, the barbell curl like, or something. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I'm trying to think of other bilateral exercises. Yeah, barbell curl, um, even just chin ups, something like that, where they're focusing more on just getting the movement done. And over time, it might mean that they're 
increasing you know a, a dominant um side uh, in in a performance they might be getting a little bit more strain on on the right side or the left side and you might not even be able to see it too much in the exercise sometimes you roll with people like for example the barber will be at a post that angle um but that will accumulate and basically that increased tension that you're facing on that one side over time will naturally mean that it will have a bigger adaptation and grow bigger and your one won't mm. so sometimes taking a step back doing say say you've got um you know eight kilo dumbbell hammer curls and you're doing it you find that you can do 10 reps on the right arm and only nine on the left and your right arm is the one that's bigger you'll be like okay, well, that's what I need to work on. Then. So then what you might do is start each set by doing nine reps on the left and then nine on the right as well until they catch up and they're at the same pace. Um, apart from that, imbalances can also sometimes be corrected simply by using a bit of, a bit of both, really. So it might be that you only do gymnastics exercises, especially with something like running, and you might lean too much on one side. And what you might need to do is learn how to be stable on both sides. So get under a barbell, for example, and maybe a leg press and do something like glute bridges, um, you know, barbell hip thrust is what I mean. And focus on slow, slow contractions where you can look at yourself in a mirror or someone is spotting you and making sure that you're, you're perfectly aligned in a way. So, so there are different ways about it, but definitely muscle imbalances can be corrected. And a lot of the time, it just takes a little bit of that that same kind of persistence that you mentioned at the start, but in a slightly different um, training modality mm. or technique. Yeah. So you mentioned um, just in the earlier part of what you just said that there's an element of deloading. So a lot of people now in this sort of fitness and bodybuilding strength space, yeah. they think all right, I've trained for my six week, I've done my six week block, I need a deload. So the problem I have with that is that a lot of time they've not exhausted themselves to the point that they need that additional time to recover. So they're using it as like a, my friend Bob did it, so I need to do it. You know, we've got the same program, so therefore our deload should be at the same time. But there's a lot of individuality about that. And I can say it for damn definite my training is different to yours who is different to someone else's um i can handle somewhere between 15 and 20 sets to failure or very close to failure um every workout it's it's demanding i am teetering on the point where i find that it is more difficult to recover so i know it's almost like the neural fatigue so obviously my muscles can take it i've been training for a long time so it's almost like your drive. So what people use sometimes is they'll use a, um, at least at least elite athletes, they'll use like a strength like a grip test. They might yeah. do it at the start of their training sort of a program, like the start of the six weeks on a Monday. They might do it again, you know, five, six weeks later. They might find their grips exactly, exactly the same. And that's, you know, if you, you squeeze your palm as hard as you can sort of thing, you'll know it. You can actually measure that because there's only so much you can squeeze your hand. If you find yeah, at the end yeah. of six weeks, your strength, it's not firing as well. Like it's not quite there. Then it might be useful to, to deload. Um, so yes, deloading can be useful. You're not going to lose muscle from it, at least for the point, point in time that you're doing it for maybe a two to three week period. There's, there's examples in studies where people have taken, you know, one, one, two, three weeks off, return back to training and they've done their DEXA scans, their bod pods. They found they've not lost any muscle. They might appear to lose muscle because they've lost the volume is in the, the muscle glycogen, um, it doesn't appear as full, they've not got the inflammation, swelling. So yeah, I'd say there is a lot of specificity in deloading. And the next point I basically wanted to ask you about was the recovery. So how would you, what sort of things would you look at when someone's training and they've come to you and said, look, I'm, I'm struggling to recover, my strength is you know, not going up or it's at least maybe even decreasing from week to week, or if it might be a long distance sport, it might be that they, they gassed out within a certain uh, mileage. What would you say to them? Yeah. Um, once again, you, you, uh, well, I'd look at what they've been training, how they've been training, um, and where they are in a certain phase of training. Um, 
I do want to quickly go back to something you said, even for example, about um, that neural, neural fatigue. So that's sort of what I was saying about earlier with um, kind of the fatigue accumulation. Some people will say central nervous system fatigue. Um, and athletes also sometimes test their overall uh, work capacity with um, heart rate variability. Mm. Um, that, that's something we can maybe go into another time, but there, there are different ways to test it, definitely. And something that tends to coincide with what you just asked me about, say, for example, someone's not, you know, progressing anymore or they're actually going backwards. It won't just be their training that's suffering. Most of the time, it might be something like sleep as well. Um, even their appetite might be decreased. Um, they might actually just be getting sore as well. They might find that they're getting more joint pains, ache pains, uh, sorry, ache pains, <laughs> joint pains and aches. Um, and you, you have to kind of take a more holistic approach sometimes, I think. What I would say to most people in that case is if they've been training consistently and you know upping the intensity from anywhere from four to eight weeks on average for, for a single you know block of training, that's when they might actually really benefit from a deload. Um, if, however, they, they haven't been, so let's say they're only two or three weeks into a phase um, or a block of training, and they're getting all these, these problems, I might look elsewhere and say, well, look, can, can we see if something else is actually interfering with your training? Is it, you know, it, it could it be your diet? Have you, have you changed something in your diet? Um, are you reacting badly to something? Could it be even seasonal allergies for some people? But most of the time, it, it is the big areas that you want to like, so sleep, um, stress levels, and, and nutrition, they're what really, really come into it. And you want to maximize your recovery no matter where you're in your training, whether you're deloading, whether you're just at the start of a phase, whether you're in week 10 of an intense training phase, if you're an advanced bodybuilder, recovery has to be emphasized as much as training, I think. Um, and that can be, you know, active recovery. So you want to do a little bit of light movement every single day, even when you're not training, just to get the blood flow going and keep, keep the joints moving, get the um, synovial fluid into the joints and flood them with nutrients. Um, but apart from that, there are things like soft tissue work, so foam rolling, even, even massage, and there's heat and cold therapy as well, depending on what you have access to and what works best for your specific situation. So uh, it, it, it's a big mixture of all of those things. So first of all, I would look at where they are in the training, say, do they need to deload? And if it's not something where you think they need to deload, if the intensity isn't actually that high and they probably haven't accumulated a lot of fatigue, you have to look elsewhere in their life because um you know uh, as you'll know very well and talk about a lot health is basically it, you know it's not singular to any one factor is it it's not nutrition it's not diet it's not you know just stress levels it's not being able to meditate or not it is everything mm. together so yeah that brings me to my next topic so you've really summarized that well there you've really sort of almost led me into the next thing i'm going to ask you um you mentioned the importance of having a holistic approach. So yeah. what we know about elite athletes is they are able to train at high capacity. They are able to mentally deal with the fatigue, the stress in the body. You know, these are people, it might be their job that they're trying to perform. So, you know, yeah. it's crucial for them. So it's for them doing that exercise, that work in the gym, that long run, that cycle ride, swimming. It is their paid job. So they have to treat it like that and take it seriously. So when you mentioned the holistic approach of it all, would you say that, would it be fair to say that the bottleneck in most people's career in terms of being an athlete or having a good physique would be recovery? Would you say that's the key underlying feature which people have to micromanage more so than what people might? Of initially for yeah um i i, I would do um and you you actually see when you look at olympic athletes nowadays obviously a lot of ones in the past um well e even today obviously that they get injured um and careers are often very short-lived for any sort of elite athlete just because it can't be maintained for a very long time you'll find you know 10 years you know maybe a bit longer and, and a lot of people start dropping off going into something else and by then to be honest, most of the time they've done very well for themselves and, and they can afford to go and do that. Um, but 
teams nowadays, for example, even the NBA, they're taking a very, very um, centralized approach on recovery more so than in the past. And that's just because the, you know, the anecdotes and, and the scientific data uh, and the new recovery methods and everything are getting so much more attention nowadays uh, and they're, they're expanding that um, it, you, you kind of can't ignore it, I, I think, at this rate. And you'll find a lot of sports teams now actively including things like infrared therapy, um, all sorts of, you know, careful, careful nutrition, not just for performance, but for health. Um, and uh, a lot of times there will be specialized, um, for example, sports massage and physiotherapists to handle any given, you know, Olympic athlete or team. Um, and yeah, I, I mean, wouldn't you agree that, for example, in your training, if you've ever dropped off in the past in your, your emphasis on recovery or something else is hindering your recovery, that your training output goes down? Yeah, I've noticed it seems to go hand in hand with that. It seems to be a direct causality. Um, for example, when I've been in bodybuilding competition shape, my recovery is very poor. So I've had to alter my training, unfortunately, not, not out of, you know, just being lazy or just trying to make it easier, but just to be able to get some work in. So the reality is when you're 5% body fat, you're not going to be lifting. Well, I say you're not. Most people aren't going to be lifting what they're lifting prior to the competition. Um, not sensible anyway. <laughs> It's not sensible. You will suffer, and your joints will kill you for it. Um, they won't like you. Um, I wanted oh, to yeah, ask. Well, I've got. I've got a quick fire question here. So it's simple. It's just a like one sentence answer sort of thing. What would you say was? Would you say it was fair that the best recovery methods are free? Yes. Mm. yeah brilliant save save for nutrition because you have to pay for food mm. other than that yeah i'd agree so i've got a video coming up at some point perhaps um before this video will be uploaded but it's on three keys to huge muscles one of them that those three keys is actually recovery and um, it's actually the point i tried to emphasize the most and it seems that people you know we see eddie hall with expensive stem cell therapies and Ronnie Coleman and these people doing ice baths and hyperbaric chambers. And you think that's the key. That's why they're an Olympia level or Olympic level athlete. But the reality is you, you're dropping dollars to pick up dime sort of thing. You're ignoring the fact that the biggest recovery methods that you're going to benefit from are your sleep, are sound nutrition. And yeah, are things you can do and people can apply this to their training so i want that to get across quite clearly in this discussion um so yeah i'm, I'm so glad you agreed actually i was worried you weren't <laughs> next question is quite broad um how would you standardize technique in an ex exercise program so if we know that someone is for example a 20 year old man you know bob from earlier but this time he wants to be maybe like a bodybuilder he wants to have a, a men's physique you know he wants to achieve that so how would his training be specific to that in that what would he do to measure or standardize or perfect his technique and would that be through tracking would that be through videoing his workouts what would you say were the, the easiest things to apply um it, it could be a combination of those i, I think to be honest, the best way is the way humans have always done it, learn from others. So go and get a coach um, or meet someone who's, you know, experienced, go into a gym and you'll find that some people are intimidated, intimidated by the gym. But if you go and speak to someone who's trained in there, you can tell, you know, they're a consistent gym goer, they're the big guy. It might be the scariest in the gym, but they're often also the kindest and most willing to help you out. So mm. just get connected and speak to people, um, see if you can get training partners. Um, someone who could spot you uh, for a little while uh, and train you. Um, and if, if you can't do that, you know, pay for a personal trainer mm. or some fitness coach. Um, apart from that, there is a, an incredible abundance of information out there. Um, I mean, on the internet and in books. Um, part of the problem with that is that some of it is, is conflicting or low quality. 
Um, but for the most part, you can learn a, an incredible amount um, just by going online, to be honest. Um, mm. And watch people, um, you know, make sure that you're getting good sources. So someone like Jonathan or, you know, any sort of... Yourself. Yeah, but maybe uh, any sort of professional um, athlete or someone with personal um, a record, I suppose, in training people. Uh, or someone who's done scientific research in the matter, something like um, you might look to even someone like Eric Helms or Lyle McDonald, you know, very famous people in the in the exercise research space for bodybuilding. Um, and the content they put out will often be more than enough to suffice when it comes to, you know, programming technique. Um, and, and you can watch videos of people performing and compare yourself um, in a mirror, like you said or get someone to film you or film yourself and just play it back and continually work on that over time and try and mirror as best you can what you see the, the, you know, the best people doing. Um, obviously, everyone has different biomechanics, different body length, uh, limb parts, for example, and they will move slightly differently. That's totally fine. But as long as you're getting the basics right, for example, not squatting with a hunched back or, you know, deadlifting with completely straight knees and trying to lift it all from the ground unless you're you know if for some people that's okay if they're training for that but when you're starting out I don't I don't think it's the smartest thing to do you probably want to work up to that um and you know another one might be for example with overhead pressing are you, are you having your, your dumbbells right in and you're, you're flexing your elbows too much and putting pressure on that joint or are you having them more at a 90 degree angle and um or more parallel to the body, basically more vertical arms, more for, vertical forearms. Um, mm. There are lots of things to consider, uh, but yeah, a lot of the time it can just be watching other people, learning from them. And um, another thing it can be said for not doing anything that hurts. Mm. <laughs> uh, you don't want to when you're training. Mm. Yeah, you, you can get pain when you're training. That's expected in your strength training, um, muscle aches, things like that. And you would feel the burn, as they say, no pain, no gain. Um, but you don't want the pain to be sharp pain and it shouldn't be coming from the joints. If it ever is, then you need to really reassess your technique. Um, and apart from that, I think when you're starting out, just don't, you don't have to even start with a load. You don't have to have it strong weight. Um, for the most part, you want to get a technique right before you're going to anywhere onto your body and, and stress your joints with, with that load. Um, so maybe something like calisthenics for a beginner um, or very light weights and just until it, you can make sure that they're functioning properly and getting the technique right is um, just to basically summarize that last point there. Um, yeah, starting off with either no weights or very light weights until your technique is, you know, closer to, as close to perfect as you can get it. Um, you know, no one's technique is ever going to be fully perfect. But that's a very, very subjective, you know, measure. There's not even a really an objective way to measure that. Um, but you want to focus on mastering technique before you master the, the weight itself. Um, that, that's what I say is quite important as well. Yeah, I couldn't have said it better myself. Um, I mean, there's one thing I add to that. Perhaps you touched on it, but I've not really been too witty enough to notice it. Um, but if we look at people that are like for bodybuilding physiques, people of that sort of attitude, that's a, a goal sort of thing. Yeah, we noticed as at least I've heard Phil Heath say before, and I've met him. He said, you know, when I was when I was competing back when, like prior to becoming Mr. Olympia, he'd have his photo on his wall, and he would like circle parts of his body, and he'll think, all right, I need a bit more width for my shoulders. I need he'll draw a red line. He'll literally get a red line. So it ingrains in his head. He, he imagines that's what I'm gonna look like if it's a bit more. Um, same with his legs or his his back. You know, he's always trying to bring up his back. So what he did was he did, he's adapt his training to develop the outer part of his lat so you have more appearance of width. And the same applies when you're training. So you want to be able to either record your performance if you're a strength athlete, um, you use the metrics, the heart rate variability, the speed of your run. A lot of people just go for a run and think, oh, I did that quite well. It's not going to be enough. If you're someone that's really trying to maximize your results, you're going to have to do a lot more data work basically to assess how well you're doing and then from that data, you know what you need to include from that point, what you're going to change in your diet, recovery, um, training, 
you know, these are all, that's what I want to get across in this, this video. It's so holistic. It's not just one answer. I am not a diet channel. I'm not just a recovery channel. I'm, a, I'm not just a training channel. I want to be someone that can, people can understand. I give clear information that it has to be a holistic approach. It's a matrix of things which are going to deliver people the results. So you've got to stop looking at it from this. I'm training really hard viewpoint. No, everything across the board has to be parallel with that. What do you think towards that? Uh, I, you know, as you said to me a minute ago, I, I couldn't have worried about myself. Um, I, I like the time you used that. Like, it's got to be a, mat a matrix of things. Um, in, in terms of tracking and paying attention to everything, you know, it, it's, it's so important. But one thing that I've seen some people doing, um, and I don't think this is what you were, you, you were mentioning, really. Uh, this isn't what you meant, but some people do fall into this, this trap, especially people in, like, for example, the biohacking sphere. Um, they overly, overly Reductionist track. ideas. <laughs> yeah, but some, sometimes they track things a bit too much and mm. it becomes a bit monotonous and kind of all-consuming. And I think that can be another way to burn out for some people, at least, at least mentally. Mm. Um, and if it's not, I think you sort of, you sort of lose touch with your, your actual body. At the end of the day, we are, we are beings, we are creatures. And the more in tune you can be, um, you know, intellectually, but in an instinctive way with your, with your body, um, you know, how you feel, how you function, the more you can get up in the morning and say, actually today, this isn't a day that I'm, I'm able to really push it. Or sometimes you can say, look, I know that it's going to be tough for me, but I'm in a place to push this right now, um, just based on how you've been feeling, sleeping, your mindset, your how everything feels, how the, the emotional movements feel. That's something else to really track. So don't just stick to the hard metrics. Um, don't just stick to numbers. Uh, basically, learn, learn to get in tune with how you're feeling and oftentimes incorporating all these other holistic um, approaches. So recovery techniques, nutrition, Mindset, so meditation, things like that, relaxation, reducing stress. Um, it's all, all the same things we've already really mentioned, um, and, and a few others. The, the better, really. The more, the more you can hold them, the better. Is what I'm trying to say. I agree. Yes. Yeah. So, like a we, positive feedback. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, we're so. I said this before, I believe we're so dynamic as a species, and how we adapt to things. Um, it might just yeah. be that the workouts I do now. Will benefit me later the benefits i do later might benefit to me now for example today i took a rest day from training um i didn't feel great i spent 95 percent of the day lying down flat in bed it was not great but that's just the reality of my recovery that's what i need to do and then maybe that some of you may benefit from other recovery methods so it might be that you have to go for a walk or be a bit more holistic so it might be that you know you go out there walk the dog get some fresh air that's yeah. going to be good for your mind, which is going to be good for your body. And there's a whole um, psychosomatic link there. So what you just touch, touched on is exactly it. So you might want to expand on that a little bit. Yeah, no, I'm actually so, so glad that you mentioned that. Um, I think that's, that's too important, really, um, yeah, at least for the amount of attention it does receive. And um, what I mean is that it doesn't receive enough attention. <laughs> um, so, yeah, mindset and the kind of feedback loop that you get between your brain and and your body is it's not even something that we fully understand yet but we know it's you know i'm talking about scientists i'm, I'm, I'm not a scientist i just mean we isn't in mm -hmm. general um yeah it's not something we fully understand but we know that it's very very profound and it has a very powerful impact um like you mentioned earlier athletes a lot of it is the mindset that they have to be able to get through things and that same mindset oftentimes can help in their recovery and um, they have that kind of resilience in a way um it's sort of sort of a self-belief and an example might be you know more research that is coming out at the moment on the link between stress and chronic pain so we know i keep using the word we but it's known that stress um once again has a very positive uh feedback loop with chronic pain and oftentimes the pain doesn't actually correlate with any sort of injury um, and sometimes you can have an injury like an underlying pathology even a tendinopathy where you're not your joints aren't functioning properly but you, you know you're not in a high stress environment 
and there's not that kind of pain measurement there. You're not feeling any pain. Um, mm. And when you look at people who have done um, ultrasound scans and uh, you know other ways to measure joint um, joint health, basically, it, it, there's there's not really a consistent pattern between injury in some some cases and pain levels. Sometimes there can be no injury and high pain. Sometimes mm. no injury or very light injury and severe pain. And a lot of it is the mind having a kind of learned response to a situation um and that could be a movement pattern but it could be it could be something in daily life as well um it could be that when you get stressed for example even though your training um might be at the same capacity you're getting a lot more joint pain and it could be a, a you know a, a response just from the body signaling or from the brain rather um signaling to your body that no we're not we're not in a situation to be doing this and you're yeah. getting a pain response to kind of hinder you from placing even more stress on yourself um apart from that i like that you mentioned nature as well uh there, there are a lot of benefits um especially for people with any sort of underlying um you know typical stress uh inducing mental uh difficulty is probably the best way to, to say it so something like anxiety mm. depression the things we're used to hearing about yeah um getting in nature seems to have a very very beneficial effect on these people in studies at least and there are a lot of anecdotes of people seeing improvements in that way um by just getting out into nature more often surrounding yourself by it um if, if we really want to get technical we could talk about uh, even things like the electromagnetic frequencies and that from from natural you know from life itself and the the um even the beneficial effects of earthing if that's something you're going to undertake um i've which, got a video up on that soon yeah i was going to say which maybe we should we should actually talk about in another episode sometime mm. or um even get someone like bar k on to to really go into that because that that's a topic yeah. that's fascinating and i think we we really need to get more science and you know, studies done on that um there isn't too much once again because it's kind of a free therapy anyone can get outside and touch the ground and because of that reason people aren't going to be funding it because they can't yeah they can't pay to you know unless it's an earthing map or something like that um yeah so that's something that needs to be spoken about as well but nature um and overall take care of your mental health has a very very um strong role to play in how you feel physically if I just roll back a bit to the point you made about the feedback loop. Um, yeah. So what I've seen recently, it may be a study that was quite a while ago, might be more recent, is that they had a group of elderly, I'll say elderly, they're older than me, <laughs> older women, and they had joint conditions, arthritic pain, perhaps osteoporosis, whatever it is. Yeah. Um, what they found was that they got one group to just carry on doing as they're doing. So when they get up out of their chair, they go, oh, oh, that hurt. Oh, no. Oh, God. Then yeah. they got the other group to, and they said to them, you know, whatever you do, don't make a sound when you get up out of your chair. Be quiet. Don't, don't make a point that you got out of your chair and it hurt. Don't say anything. What they found was the group that made the sound reported back, obviously a survey, they reported back that they had much 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 higher pain levels i believe the amount was 30 percent. and when you're someone that you know is struggling to get out of a chair that 30 percent can really make or break a person it can affect how their, their cognition is how they feel day to day so being able to as we keep saying zoom out from the frame and see okay we've we've got someone here that um can't recover or they can't they don't feel right doing what they're doing is it that the reason for that is because of the thoughts that they're having around that, the thoughts that are having around their body, you know, not feeling right. Is that a continuous loop? Um, so that's something I think a lot of people ignore and that's part of what it is when I use imagery, when I check train. So I uploaded a video recently and, you know, I saw, you could see where I was looking um, as I was lifting the weights, doing a chest press. I was looking just yeah. slightly up. I was thinking, I was, I was imagining, my, what I could see around me was complete blank. 
all I could see, all my eyes were open, I, my, my brain was blank. All I could see was my, my hands going in. I was just yeah. thinking, hands going in, my chest is moving. I was imagining my chest going, pff, pff. you know, there's a whole, there's a whole dynamic there about having your mind into the muscle. And that's something which people miss out on training. And like I mentioned earlier about standardizing your technique, using those tools, I think that's, it's essential if you're going to be a high performing athlete. Um, yeah. I, I think so anyway. No, uh, I think you're totally right. It's, it's, it's age old wisdom by this point. Uh, you know, you look, you look at the earliest strong men and I mean, these guys were incredible. They performed feats that, you know, even a lot of the most advanced people now um, can't do. And obviously they weren't enhanced back then. I'm talking about 1800s. Um, mm. And something that was always emphasized and shown off really um, was the incredible technique that they had. And mm. the ability to do all these complex, you know, lifts and, you know, movements. Um, and that takes an incredible amount of, mind muscle connection and then you go you fast forward to the, um you know to the to the golden era of bodybuilding and you know around that period as well and you have someone like Arnold Schwarzenegger who famously would say you have to get your mind in the muscle and everyone started to repeat it and, and it what is else true. did he say James are you pushing me for a movie quote yeah what else did he say pumping iron Pumping iron. Oh, this one escapes me. You know, I, I, I don't know. All right. On, I mean. we'll, we'll leave that to the viewers to guess. Um, yeah, okay, I might yeah, put up maybe. a little little picture of what I mean. You'll you'll let be able to understand what I mean. Let let them do it. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. No. Um. But yeah. Obviously, back on the thread of thought of that the mind muscle connection. And the way, the way there is a kind of positive feedback loop, um, yeah, I, I think it's spot on, really. If you look at an athlete, they're not going to be someone who's not, you know, what's the way to word this? If an athlete is going to lift something, or they're going to run, uh, or they're going to sprint, or they're going to jump, they're going to be so in tune from their training and, you know, deliberately trying to imagine and, the you know, yeah, tend to the right muscles at the right time that it's it's not going to be an issue for them to emphasize one body part if they need to in a movie just because they're so in tune whereas someone who's a beginner who doesn't have these neural pathways really built up and i think a lot of that is what it comes down to having the right neural pathways um where your body yeah. is used to contracting um in a certain way um you know they're going to struggle you know comparatively so, for yeah, example, that's... bodybuilders might be able to get down to a squat, mm. look like they're doing almost exactly the same technique, and one will have much more focus and intensity felt on the quads and one more so in the glutes just by how they're focusing on the contraction. So, um, yeah, uh, th th there's definitely, definitely something to be said for it. I agree, yeah. And what we've also got to look at, I'm so glad you touched on that point. Um, we look at, for example, someone like Phil Heath. He's one of my favourite bodybuilders, if you couldn't tell. Um, if you look at his, if he if he couldn't um, if you could look at his training and you see what he's doing, everyone thinks nah, it's just pump work. It's just you know move, moving it. You got to think this guy is he's enormous. People don't realize he he's an enormous person. Um, he gets in the off season he would get up to 280, 285 pounds quite handily um, with abs. He'd be in good shape. Um, we've got to realize with his training and the fact that he's doing this kind of like pump sort of work is that his ability to contract his muscles is by far superior to anyone else's, at least most people. Um, so him doing that explosive movement, he's learned to do that for his neural pathways that you should have just mentioned. And it's not that someone else needs to emulate his training. That's where his training is specific to him. So it might be that, you know, as a beginner, you might meant, I think he kind of said it earlier, but like, you might see you're doing a shoulder press, you know, find your form like 90 degrees, whatever it is, lift yeah. it up. You might have like quite a, quite a smooth cadence. So what you can do in that time that you've got the muscle under tension is you can think, okay, I need to get my, my front deltoid short. So it needs to be somewhere up here and somewhere where I'm at here. You know? um, so from that, you know, that's my range of motion. That's where I need to apply force. 
And as time goes on, you can become a bit more ballistic. So in my example of the training video the other day, you'll see the first few reps are quite fast, but my training is specific to me in that my muscular intention, where I'm putting the focus, the mind to muscle connection, we keep saying, that's how that's applicable. I'm able to contract my chest fibers using that kind of cadence. What I do, however, to limit like the joint problems and things that, like that, is I might use a different intensifier. So I might use a rest pause, or it might be that I just slow down slightly the eccentric portion of the rep so I can control the weight, not get the elastic strength and focus yeah. purely on hypertrophy. Yeah, and there, there's, I, I like that you mentioned, um, this is a bit of a caveat, but the, really like the slow, slowly um, going on the eccentric in a sort of movement. Um, it reminds me of, the, the older uh, Russian uh, prisoners, basically, I, th I think it was the prisoners, wasn't it? Who done super slow training. They, they basically, mm. they run out of ways to use and they just started, it might be in the army, actually, the military, they run out of equipment and um, in certain, yeah, it was. Um, in, in that context, basically, they couldn't add any more weight because they didn't have any. So they just started slowing down their reps. And these people brought incredible physiques and capacities just by doing very, very, very slow um, training. Now, part of it, is that there's that increased time under tension. So that, that's what's going to be the primary driver of you know, muscular adaptation. Um, but another really important part of it is they have to focus so much on you know, contracting the right muscles for such an extent. Mm. They're getting very, very good at it. Um, and the same thing is actually used um, by a lot of explosive um, athletes in isometrics, for example. So they do overcoming isometrics um, or, or isometrics where they can't, they physically cannot move the load and they just push as hard as they can in a certain um, range of motion and oftentimes max out that, that isometric. Um, or, or they do it for a certain amount of time. And what that seems to do is build up a neural pathway, but then when they go to contract in that same way, under um, you know freer conditions where they're moving an actual load or or just the body part, they can do it with uh, a much more explosive output. Yeah, I mean, what where I really want to make sure that viewers understand here is when James saying James is saying you know these are enforcing your neural pathways, your adaptation, so you can come in tune with the muscle, so to speak. It's yeah. not that you should only do static contraction or an isometric contra contraction don't do that that's not what we're saying and people are going to watch this and think you know they'll clip the video there i think oh there we go i know what i'm doing I'm fine no it's it's specific to your point in time in your training career where for example a lot of bodybuilders can't develop their side delt so what they might yeah. do is they might do a static hold up here like side raises like a band where their resistance profile is highest at the side they'll hold it for maybe a few seconds when you're down They'll get more blood flow to that muscle, and that will help them, like, tune in with it, as you said. So yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, yeah, and you know, that's sort of why I prefaced it by saying uh, explosive athletes. Uh, mm. What well, who came to mind um, is actually Bruce Lee. He was very famous for yeah. his isometrics, and uh, I think obviously he had world class, probably never to be seen again, genetics. Um, mm. But there's something to be said that for his training techniques, and uh, he did go about it in a very smart way, I think. And his use of isometrics is something that you know at least he and many others since have put down to, um, or at least have partially um, noted have contributed basically to their ability to explode at such speed. Um, and contract the muscles and perform, you know, really powerful feats of strength. Um, mm. So, you know, it's a slight caveat there to go on about isometrics, but building up the right connections, um, it sounds a bit like uh, a pseudoscience in a way, because there's no kind of hard data behind this. You can't say, oh yeah, I've got a, a level five, I don't know, neural contraction. Neural connection. <laughs> yeah. You can't do it. <laughs> mm. yeah, it's, but, it's, not, it's not a qualitative number or quantitative number. It's yeah. like, you, you think you feel. Like, Mm. Yeah, exactly. So, so we can kind of joke about it, but it's not, it's not the pseudoscience. science. Um, th there is science behind it. We know that we build um, neural pathways, and we know that we can learn to contract better. 
Um, but when it comes to tracking something like that, that probably comes back to what I said about earlier, where you don't just want to stick to hard metrics, you want to, you want to be able to get tune in with your body. Um, and to bring it right back to the start of the, the conversation when we talk about specificity, mm. you know, that, that applies in no matter what training modality you're going for. Um, for example, a sprinter, let's say Usain Bolt, he, he's going to train in a way um, to learn to maximally contract his, his glutes and his hamstrings. And it, he's not just going to do that by sprinting. So that, that's sort of what I mean. Yeah, that makes complete sense. I mean, um, before I just wrap this this chat up, I want to say about Bruce Lee, just you mentioned. Um, so he's doing a lot of isometric contractions, like he might be doing, you know, like you've seen him where he lies on a board or something, he has his hips elevated and he's lowering his abs, just so slowly holding it. Might be doing like yeah. five minutes, 10 minutes, whatever amount of time he did. You got to think he's a martial artist. He's a fighter. So he's emulating what he would be doing in an actual fight. He would have his core still. There'll be some rotation. So he'd do some Russian twists, things of that nature. But yeah. he's trying to keep his core to protect his organs as tight as humanly possible. So that's, that's why his training was specific. And everything he was doing wasn't to gain weight and gain maximum muscle muscle size although he's he's pretty muscular pretty jacked for a, a little guy sort of thing but um he was he, he, what he was doing was trying to maximize his almost like his explosiveness with the amount of muscle they had and his weight so he could be yeah. as effective as possible at the art that he performed brilliant I, th I think you're lucky that he's not alive watching this you called him a little guy <laughs> yeah he went like that i don't think a lot of people like it when i call them a little guy <laughs> No, I was just saying Bruce Lee would have been a scary person to... to I wouldn't mess with that guy, no chance. Yeah. <laughs> nope. I'll, I'll be running away for the hills. Yeah. Anyway, um, so thanks very much for your time, James. If you'd like to just mention your, perhaps your Instagram account, um, just so viewers can find you. Yeah, so um, you can find me on Instagram at Fitness with Jam. Uh, it's literally J-A-M, uh, the start of my name, also my initials. Um, on there, I sometimes post things about fitness. That's something I will be doing more. Most of the time, it is just me, you know, sharing things about lifestyle, general, general daily life. Um, you know, at a moment, you know, carnival meals, um, going out into nature, everything like that, and anything from foraging even sometimes. Um, I talk about earthing. I share any sort of content that might be relevant to new studies on training, nutrition, um, sometimes health epidemiology, often to market. Um, yeah, so I've seen that. You get some humor on there as well. Um, the only people who might not feel so welcomed and this isn't out of disrespect to them it's more just for the, the propaganda and that is our uh, vegans um if you're a vegan feel free to say hi and don't get upset <laughs> if you see me posting something against the diet uh, apart from that yeah yeah that's where you can find me. yeah we're good people we're not out there to harm people we're not promoting we're something with the intention of people you know coming to cause damage to themselves we are really our health focused people and that's something I'm just trying to get across in every video, you know, health first, physique next, yeah. you know, Absolutely. but there is a way to draw them both together. Um, yeah. The other thing as well is you have to learn to laugh at yourself. You have to go to take those if you're going to give them out. So, yeah. Yeah. And I think that's I really something agree. we find a lot in this community. So, uh, yeah, it's, a good, it's good to be part of. Brilliant. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much for your time again, James. I appreciate you coming on. No worries. Thank you very much, Jonathan. It's been great.